this video, we pick up a journey that we began a few months ago in the Gospel of John. As we began this journey, we saw that John tells us in chapter 20, uh, verse 30 and 31, why he wrote this Gospel. And he tells us that Jesus did many other signs, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And if you trace these things all the way through, the signs um, are showing us evidence. Evidence about who Jesus is and what he came to do. And the evidence calls us to belief. Belief that Jesus is who he says he is. He is the Christ. He is the Son of God. He is the one who came to sort out the problem in our world. And by believing in him, we may have life. So evidence, belief, and life are key things that we see in John's Gospel. And in this story, John builds on that evidence about Jesus. As always, before I take you through this passage, I encourage you to take some time to read it a few times, just to familiarize yourself with the story. Try and notice some of the key repetition or key ideas. Look at the main characters and see what is the evidence that John is giving us in this section that is growing our belief in Jesus which leads to life through Jesus. And then spend some time praying. Pray that God would open your eyes to understand his word rightly, that he would prepare you to be able to teach this well to others. And one of the tools that I used in my preparation was the narrative plot arc tool. And in this tool, we are looking for the setting, the conflict, a point in the story that is climactic, and then you see from that point how the story resolves. And then you get a new setting. And in this story, uh, verse 1 gives us our setting. So Jesus goes back to Jerusalem to a Jewish festival. We aren't told which Jewish festival. It, John specifically mentions um, the details in other parts of his gospel of specific festivals. So the fact that he leaves a general here means that the specifics of which festival aren't vitally important to understand the story. We see the conflict in verses 2 to 7 uh, rising as uh, Jesus goes and speaks to an invalid and asks him if he wants to get well. Jesus is offering him new life. And the climactic moment in the story we see in verse 8 and the uh, sorry 8 to the first part of verse 9 so in this section here, we see the climax. And then from the second part of verse 9 through to verse 14, we get the story resolving itself. And then verse 15 gives us our new setting leading into what we see in the next story. This is a really helpful tool to use while you are digging into a, a narrative story, trying to spot what the climax of the story is. Another useful tool to use is just to look for your main characters and this being the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus is very much in focus in this story and so we track where we see Jesus in the story. And then another key character in this story is obviously this invalid. Is spoken of as an invalid. In the second half of the story, we meet the Jewish leaders. And the Jewish leaders play a key role in the following, the rest of chapter 5. And actually from this point onwards, uh, chapter 5 really is a, a new section in the gospel. Uh, from chapter 5 all the way up to chapter 11. And a key thing that we see happening in these chapters is the Jewish leaders increasingly are standing opposed to Jesus. Another thing we see um, being mentioned here is the Sabbath. The Sabbath is mentioned um, leading again into the next section where a lot of what Jesus does around the Sabbath generates a lot of tension with the Jewish leaders and we see that happening here and the evidence that John has been building we're told when Jesus turns water into wine that that was the first sign and this here is the third sign that we see and we see that it is a healing miracle 
Jesus asked the key question, do you want to get well? And we're told that the man was cured, he had been healed, the one who made me well, who had made him well. And as we're looking out for this evidence, we see uh, this is the key evidence. At once, the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. He had been healed. The one who made me well. Again, he was healed. The one who had made him well. All of this is pointing to Jesus as the one with the power over sickness. And in this case, over paralysis. This man had been an invalid for 38 years. Now, one very important thing to see in this specific story is that in verse 6 and verse 14, we are given a clarity on exactly what happened here. When we see this word here, the NIV translated as learned, it's actually the Greek word to know. Jesus knew that this man had been in this condition. Just as we saw in chapter 4, how Jesus with the Samaritan woman, um, he knew all about her past. So Jesus knew all about this man's past. And verse 14 shows us that later Jesus found him and said, See, you are well again. Stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. Now the original Greek of this section shows us that this man's paralysis, the fact that he was an invalid, was as a result of some sin that had happened in the past. It's very important when dealing with this to be careful that not all um, sin, not all blindness or being lame or paralyzed is as a result of some specific sin. Most of our sicknesses and struggles in this life are just as a result of living in a broken world. But for this man, it was very specifically because of some sin that 38 years earlier he had ended up as an invalid. And Jesus knew this. He knew this about him. And so he came up to him and said, do you want to get well? But this is much more than a question of, do you want to be healed? Jesus is actually saying to the man, will you leave behind you the life that got you here? Will you stop sinning? These are are two imperatives. It's also useful to look out for imperatives. Uh, They are verbs that are commands. See, you are well again, is the one imperative here. So look what Jesus has done for you. Look what I've done. You are well again. See it and marvel at it. And in response, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Now, this is early on in the Gospel of John. And we're going to see these themes being developed. The evidence will grow. And as Jesus says to this man, stop sinning, the reality is, The message of the gospel tells us that in and of ourselves we can't stop sinning. And the something worse here, I think ultimately points us ahead to uh, the judgment, the final judgment. If we continue in our sin, something far worse than earthly paralysis will be the result. We will be cut off from God for all eternity. And Jesus' healing of this man here, do you want to get well? is ultimately pointing ahead to the great healing that would come as a result of Jesus' death on the cross. And if you want to cross-reference the great Old Testament passage with this passage, Isaiah 53, uh, verse 3 to 5, is a great passage to go to. And when Isaiah says he, he carried our infirmities, the Greek translation of that word infirmities is the same as the Greek word for the invalid here. And then... Verse 5 ends by saying, by his wounds, you are, we are healed. We are made well again. And that healed is much bigger than just a physical healing. Where we, it's, a, it's an incredible thing to see this man stand up at once and carry his mat. But it is a much bigger thing for people who, as Ephesians 2 tells us, are dead in their sins. For them to be made alive again and to be given life that begins now and continues forever. And that is ultimately what Jesus came to do. This evidence is calling us to believe that Jesus is able to do incredible things like this, but he's actually able to do the even bigger thing of making people who are spiritual paralytics to give them the ability to live full lives for his glory 
And that is what John is building the evidence about in this section, showing Jesus' power to grow our belief in Jesus because by believing in Jesus, we find life in his name. So I trust that as you dig in further, that this story will grow your wonder of who Jesus is and what he's come to do. And as we continue this journey, let's be praying that our own belief would grow, that we would rejoice in the life that is ours because of Jesus, and that those who we teach would also stand in wonder at who Jesus is and what he's done. To meet somebody who can say, get up, pick up your mat and walk, and then for that to happen is a phenomenal thing. And Jesus has done something even greater. He says, if you believe in me, you will have life. Life that begins now and continues forever. So let's rejoice in him. And as we teach others, let's pray that they would do that too. Well, God bless.